Good yeah. afternoon. Uh, this is John Palin with HKA, and uh, you are now attending uh, the recap of the ABA Forum Leadership Roundtable COVID-19 Construction Impact Series. Uh, first, to start, just remind everybody you should be on mute. If you have a question and you are an attendee, you can use the, uh, the question box on your control panel. If you're a panelist, uh, please remember to use the chat box. So we uh, have been producing, along with the ABA, a series of programs uh, that really were centered to focus on providing a forum of, for construction industry leaders and, and, and participants to share lessons learned during the crisis, during the COVID crisis. And for the last four months, uh, the ABA has been producing uh, webinars. They, uh, webinars. They've produced 11 webinars featuring industry leaders, uh, covering topics that are most important to the industry, and really getting ahead of the the um, the issues that are happening within the industry. And we've been proud to be part of it. We, uh, my, myself, Tracy Doyle, uh, Frank Junta at HKA, along with a series of other people, have been part of the program. And we've been very uh, honored to contribute as we've developed these webinars. Every week, we've had great response. Uh, we've had over 100 people, sometimes 300 people on the programs. And uh, the feedback that we've gotten from the surveys is everyone feels that these programs are, are, are critical, that not only do they find them valuable, but they want them to continue. So what we decided to do before we, we, we've been doing these programs for four months, we decided to take a step back uh, for the summer. And this hour, hour program is really just to reflect on the highlights of what we talked about on that program. I'm gonna call it the red zone uh, of the ABA COVID program. And um, we've invited back some of the panelists. So what you're looking at on the screen right now are some of the moderators and some of the panelists that uh, agreed to come back and give their feedback and, and participate in this dis roundtable discussion. Uh, but if this is by no means all of the panelists, it would be quite a long list. Uh, but what I'd like to do before we get started, I'd like to, because we only have an hour, we're, we're, we're not going to have a chance to introduce everyone. But I would like to introduce uh, Christine Hughes, who is the chair of the ABA Forum uh, on Construction. And I'd like to start to say a few words about uh, the program and you know her view of how it's going. Christine. Thank you, John. Uh, and welcome, everyone. And thank you all for joining us. Um, I am the current chair of the ABA Forum on Construction Law. If you're not familiar with our organization, we're the largest organization of construction lawyers on the planet. And uh, we have some 6,000 members. Uh, across the United States, Canada, and really from all over the world. And we are here to be thought leaders, to be supporting the industry, supporting the lawyers who support the industry. And I want to start my remarks by giving a very heartfelt thanks to Tracy Doyle and Frank Junta, who called me back in March and said, let's have a conversation about the COVID pandemic and what we might do to support the forum through this effort. And that was a very critical time because the forum is an association of members who have live in-person meetings generally, and we were having to cancel meeting left and right because of the COVID crisis. And so Tracy and Frank came to me with this idea, and then John came alongside of them and have been such great partners with us and our staff. Rob Roosh is another one of my colleagues to the forum who is in charge of our distance learning on a regular basis for the forum. I put Rob and Tracy and Frank together, and they have just been this amazing group uh, with John's help to put together these programs for us week after week. And uh, the whole idea here was to have a platform that is free, okay, number one, free, number two, leaders of the companies themselves, as well as lawyers, but leaders, and have the event open to leaders as well as lawyers. So yes, we're the ABA Forum on Construction Law, but we are serving the industry. And through this COVID 
leadership roundtable, we have really been able to have people who are in the driver's seat in their companies, the owners, the CFOs, the risk managers, et cetera, on our calls, talking about what's working, what's not, uh, ideas to share, brain share, pain share. You've heard of that. That's what we're trying to do here. So we're really very proud. The forum has never done anything like this before. I'm so very proud that we were able to do this. And we're going to continue doing this roundtable into the fall. We are currently on a hiatus the month of August, but we'll be back online September 15 for three weeks. And we'll take a break in October and do another three weeks in November. So please do join us. I also want to start by saying that if you are interested in hearing what we've talked about before in our early 11 sessions, you can go on to the American Bar Association website, and you've got the link here on the program materials. Go to the construction law page, and you'll see a link to our resource page for the Leadership Roundtable series. There is a recording for every week, and there is a summary for every week. And so I, uh, I invite you to engage and use those resources to help yourselves, or if nothing else, just to encourage yourself on a hard day, because uh, these times are challenging for everyone. So thank you all. Thanks, special thanks to Tracy, Frank, Rob, and John for all your uh, hard and heavy lifting thus far and helping us make this a success again. And uh, I look forward to our recap today. Thanks, John. Great. Thanks, Christine. So to get started, uh, what I thought we would do is we would start at the at the beginning, way back in April on April seventh, when the world uh, still didn't didn't seem quite as crazy as it does now, and this was really just hitting us, and we really didn't realize what the impact was. And I remember when we first put this program together, uh, the first program was let's just find out what's happening in the marketplace, and that's really was the 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 theme behind this, you know, what. The job site status and what impact uh, is the the pandemic having uh, on job sites and what were the most pressing issues? So I thought you know what I, what I'd like to do is I pulled a couple of quotes from uh, from each of the programs and quotes that I thought were the ones that had the biggest that kind of jumped out off the page a little bit. And the first one was actually from Michael uh, who was on this call. And he, he mentioned uh, that we're still in the beginning stages of figuring out how, to, how we're going to work with each, each contractor. Each project is unique, but our contracts provide a pretty clear and detailed framework for resolving any potential issues relating to delay. So Michael had a, had a, pretty, um, a pretty good feel for the contracts being phrased in a way that we were gonna be able to ride the storm out. And then Leslie O'Neill mentioned, she said, you know, there are real concerns about safety of trans workers to and from the job sites. Recently, we had to hire more bus drivers, more buses, and to help workers maintain required social distancing. More buses needed for fewer people. More and more transport time to and from job site is a costly exercise. So really we're talking about, okay, what are we dealing with in terms of, is our contracts helping us with the, the, the delay? And most people at that point in time were playing pretty nice. Uh, the reaction at that time was, how are we dealing with this new environment? How are we mobilizing our people? So Michael, I'm gonna, gonna start with you. Michael, first of all, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Good. Uh, what's your take? How have, th how have things, change since April 7th or have they? Yeah, so I think that we we know a lot more um, since April 7th. Things have sort of settled down into a familiar pattern uh, since that time frame. Uh, we, what we've observed is that the resistance to the mask, to the PPE, to some of the, some of the things, the restrictions that, that are going on on our sites, um, that has really waned. That isn't there anymore. When I go visit our sites, uh, it's amazing to see the compliance with respect to, to safety. And I think that our contractors and our employees have really bought into that culture of safety. I think that that is, that is terrific. Part of that is being driven by the fact that we get visited by city inspectors every um, two or three times a week. Um, and so they're, they're helping, to, helping us to enforce those, those restrictions. But by and large, our, our projects are still moving ahead. But what, 
what gives me pause um, is that we have seen we have seen some claims come through um, from subcontractors um, up through contractors where the claims of COVID impacts. But when we go dig and we look under the hood, they, they, those COVID impacts aren't really there. Maybe maybe somebody um, is is claiming that they're out they're out because of COVID, but they didn't have it, or or um, or we've seen that uh, there were other problems going on on the job site, uh, but but everything was being thrown into a COVID bucket. So I just want to I want to caution: um, don't make those sorts of claims. Um, they can they can turn into false claims very quickly, and they can really erode the trust on a project. Which I think leads me to my third point, which is so much about success for for us, and I think across the industry is is built on trust between all the parties and making sure that we have open lines of communication and that we're able to work together through this time frame. And, and that was one of the things I wanted to emphasize uh, when I first came on in April and I, I want to emphasize again today is that communication is is key. Um, working together is key as we, as we solve all of these problems. Thanks, John. Great. Thank you, Michael. Now, Frank, you were moderating this program. You were throwing all the questions out there and getting a feel for um, some of the issues that people were dealing with. And, and I know you and I talked, and again, at that time, everyone was was playing nice and really just trying to keep things moving and react. Um, how have things changed over the last four months? Well, it's interesting, John. Uh, you're correct. At the beginning, as Michael pointed out, and as Leslie's uh, quote that you see there points out, uh, people were sort of in what I call the recognition recognition of the problem phase. Uh, how do I keep my project going? Um, what do I have to do? Matter of fact, there was a lot of questions about, can I keep my project going? There were a lot of inconsistent government regulations at the time. So everyone was trying to figure out the situation. And as Michael said, communication was key. Uh, as you know, it was one of the... Um, uh, key points of the discussions in the early days. Uh, how do I keep going and how do I keep my people safe so I can keep it going? So I think that as we sat there, and we've said this numerous times, and Christine has commented on it numerous times as well, uh, no one thought as we sat here today, we would be still looking at this situation. We thought we'd be looking back and saying, wow, how did we get through that? So I think one of the things, and, and Michael just said it, we're learning, we're, we're coming into a status quo. We've now learned what the requirements are. Uh, contractors are keeping up with jobs, uh, albeit with the social distancing and the requirements by regulations to keep people safe. But the one thing that it's settling into now is that contractors have, and all parties have really been hurt by the additional costs of construction. And I understand what Michael was saying about uh, people throwing everything into COVID, and that may be correct, uh, but there has been obviously a real impact as a result of COVID. Contractors' efficiencies have gone down dramatically. Um, social distancing has caused uh, a lot of impact to the construction industry. And so now I think we're settling into a trying to measure what the impact has been and figure out how we can now get pr projects across the finish line in a cost-effective manner and what it means for projects going forward. So I think that's how it's changed and where we are at the moment, John. Okay. Uh, Pam, I'm. Uh since you've you've been covering this since the beginning uh what have you seen what what what, is, what what stands out the most to you in terms of the construction climate in august of 2020 versus the construction climate in april well i think frank is right and we've definitely seen an uptick in activity um and but there's still in some regions there are still some there's still some resistance to PPE and and masks and you can see that depending on where you live, uh, the South where we are having I'm in New Orleans where we're having this huge outbreak or in the South in general not New Orleans but uh, you know masking is still you can go by a job site and uh, it's it's not happening so. Um, you know, people are eager to get back into it, and I think that the the issue of um, the uh, sorry, the 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 uh, unemployment 
is having an impact, the uh, unemployment checks uh, are, are having an impact on getting people back to work um, because they're making you know, that good amount from the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, we're seeing an uptick. Uh, the the um, Commerce Department uh, released activity and we're actually up over last June, was up over last June. So I think we're seeing a gradual um, accommodation of social distancing, not just in the field, but in engineering, we're using a lot more. Uh, in engineering, they're using a lot more um, virtual reality, we're getting used to the Zoom meetings, getting used to the discussions, um, virtual reality. Uh, so I think we're learning, everybody in the industry is learning to work smarter um, and that, you know, everybody's gradually coming back. And But the, the big flip side of that is that uh, a lot of the projects have been canceled or stalled or not moving forward, you know, especially in public transportation and um, uh, highway, high DOTs are, have just been hit tremendously. Um, so that is going to take years for us to figure out where 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 we where we are um, and and sure. what can move forward? Okay, thank you. So to move on, the next the the, the next program, and obviously the once we got a, a sense of you know where are we with everything, money matters. Where you know where the 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 cash flow issues and how things were being managed. Um, from a financing standpoint, and the impact on financing was huge. Uh, and a, a quote uh, from from Brett, who's on on the call today: Contractors grappling with ways to pay for pay their subcontractors and cover their own costs should consider asking for retainage, a portion of the contract price that owners hold until work is substantially complete. This should be paid early. Working with contractors and subcontractors to keep them paid will ultimately help the project. So Brett, how does this advice hold today? Uh, and, and what additional advice would you say regarding financing in general? Well, I, I kind of echo what people were saying previously. I think we've gotten to a new normal. Um, when everything first came down with COVID, it felt like I was working 15 hour days just to keep up with every change that we had on, seemed like on an hourly basis. Um, so as far as the financing goes, we have worked cooperatively with owners and our subcontractors and have used different tools such as uh, an early reduction retainage to make sure that cash is flowing to subcontractors to keep them going. And that's the key in times like this when uh, someone had mentioned earlier that I think it was Pam that, you know, when you have subcontractors maybe losing their lower skilled workers due to the benefits they can get from the federal government, um, you got to do everything you can to help them and keep them viable. That's the last thing you want is a sub default when you're dealing with all these other issues at the same time. Now, uh, Rob, I'm going to I'm going to put you on the spot a bit. Do you have any thoughts from your perspective and your clients uh, regard, in regards to finding financing and, and what, what challenges do you see they are having right now? Yeah, assume you mean me, uh, Rob yep. Roosh. Yeah. So um, I I think that um, that you know in my region, which is basically New England, there are um, some serious. I've had clients with setbacks that have, for reasons um, in in several instances that have been a matter of optics, scaled back projects. I've had uh, also for reasons uh, more to do with uh, finances, scale back projects. There is a severe um, state and local uh, budget impact with municipal state work that um, Pam described is is also a significant factor here, and I think it um, that the shoe really hasn't dropped yet. I mean, initially we, we did see a lot of work get accelerated, particularly you know highway bridge work that um, was scheduled to be done later in the season could be moved up or accelerated, um, and and so oddly enough there was probably a, a short term bump with with much of that um it i think it it varies um from um place to place obviously there are still a wealth of uh housing you know high-end housing hotel projects going forward regionally and um 
and I, I've kind of been surprised at the resiliency, I guess, of the in investors in these projects. Um, but I, I think that it's, it's still a relatively strong market, and I'm pleased to see that, um, that, that I'm busy, at least, on new projects that are going forward. Um, so that's, that's my two cents, John. Okay. We'll keep this rolling here and we'll get into, roll right into um, workforce and employment challenges. Kim, get ready, I'm gonna ask you a question. Um, we have a quote here uh, from Jessica Hill. We have not seen many worker, worker compensation claims as a result of the virus. From my perspective, it's a little early. We haven't seen a lot of workers expose, exposure cases yet, we have employees asking about relief for injuries they sustain while working from home, which can be a little tricky. So, Kim, when we had this program and we were talking about there wasn't a lot of issues or, or claims relating, relating to the virus, what are you seeing from your clients now? Uh, has that changed? Well, we've certainly seen um, more projects certainly have impacts of COVID, you know, cases on their projects by their employees, by contractors, employees, and um, we've seen job sites shut down as uh, certain employees have contracted the virus. Um, I, I don't know about workers' compensation. I think that is still getting worked out. I'm, I'm based in Illinois. And the state of Illinois has gone back and forth on uh, what, how workers' compensation claims are going to be um, decided related to COVID. So I think all the states are trying to trying to react to this. It may be still a little early for those type of claims to be working through a court system, I would say. Um, but I, I think that um, you know. If there's been a job site where there hasn't been COVID, I would be really surprised to see that. So, so looking back on the program, what would you say? What were some of the things that stood out? I mean, obviously, you know how people are dealing with this, and the claims regarding the virus is very important. But now, a lot what we're hearing about, okay, well. People are coming back on the job. You know, how is that going to be impacted? What, what 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 stands out the most from that April 21st program to you that was you know the biggest thing that was the issue or 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 an important point that was made to address some of these issues? Is there anything that from the program that that, that you want to highlight? Yeah, I, I think. Uh... So this program was on April 21st. I think a lot of lawyers, especially in um, employment related lawyers were trying to figure out all of the new laws that were passed just within that time. So you had the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, if I'm, <laughs> if I'm getting the words right there, and you had the CARES Act, and those all had new, um, we, you know, family and medical leave provisions and how do you interact those leaves with the FMLA and other leaves that are available. Um, and so just trying to understand how to how all those things worked and how to implement them in within your company um, was very fast and furious. Um, and I don't think we've seen the end of that. I mean, right now we have schools that are about to start or not start or whatever right so mm -hmm. um, this is just going to start all over again with employees trying to figure out um, how they can go back to work with their children and quite frankly that families first coronavirus relief act provided leave for people dealing with children being at home and not physically in a school and maybe you had employees who could deal with it for a month or two in the spring, but now they're looking at the rest of this, you know, rest of 2020. 
and how are they going to do with that? So I, I would say we, we're going to have another round of that when school starts. Is, is my yeah. Guess. yeah. On, on June 23rd, uh, we had a program that focused on surety construction relationships under COVID-19. And um, that was moderated uh, by Rick Moffat, who could who was supposed to join but couldn't join. But we have Doug with us and we also have Ron with us. So I'm gonna, gonna uh, grab a quote from you, Doug. Uh, no one in the industry likes surprises. When the die has already been cast, there's less possibility to mitigate potential loss and exposure for all for all parties involved. If there's a cash flow problem, let's talk about it. If you're considering filing for bankruptcy, that's something you should be talking to your surety about now. It's much harder to work your way through a problem when you're late in the game. Problems just don't go away. They need to be addressed or they get worse, particularly when you're dealing with construction. Good advice. Doug, what are you seeing in, in terms of people following that advice? Um, I think we are getting uh, more contacts uh, from you know our accounts, which is a good thing. Uh, with that said, we have not seen uh, you know uh, an uptick uh, or a spike in claims as it relates to construction surety. Um, that has been pretty steady. Uh, as you know, as the whole you know industry knows, uh, there's a lag in surety claims. So um, you know there there's time. Uh, anywhere from several months to potentially uh, a couple of years before, you know, when there's an economic downturn to where we actually realize uh, claims in our industry. Uh, but with that said, I mean, obviously we're trying to stay on top of it. We're trying to be proactive. And if there's an opportunity uh, or if our accounts want to uh, talk to us, we're certainly, uh, certainly listening. Um, we know this is uncharted waters. Uh, these are different times and uncertain times. Uh, so, you know, we need to collaborate and uh, communicate in order to get through them. Is there anything, Doug, again, from that program in terms of points that was were, were, was raised regarding, regarding surety relationships that is different now than was it was back in, in June? Or, or things, are things changing rapidly or are things changing gradually. I would say gradually right now. I mean, you, you know, and this is where we always say we don't like surprises. So if there's stuff bubbling, we want to know about them. Um, mm -hmm. But at this point in time, within the industry as a whole, I think we're anticipating more claims. I think um, that's probably going to happen. Uh, but with that said, uh, as of this date, we have not seen uh, that spike and hopefully you know like i said we'll be able to ride it out but there's going to be liquidity issues we know that there's going to be um, issues as it relates to these additional costs who's going to cover them um, how are they going to be addressed so um, you know, there's a lot more to a lot more to find out over the next um, next several months okay so we've talked about four programs you know the first program what 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 do the job sites look like when this first happened? Financing and cash flow, uh, workforce issues, and now surety. And uh, just to keep this moving, I just kind of rolled through. I didn't really open it up to the panel, but I, I want to just take a second. And if, if anyone wants to, before we move on to the next programs, because we do have more, obviously have several programs we'd like to go over. But is there any points or questions or topics that any other panelists would like to bring up? regarding job site christine i would thank you for opening it up for a second i wanted to tag on to the workforce session and just comment that um we are in such a unique time now with the covid where our uh, both with our contracts and with our safety measures and just on a day-to-day -day basis our employees and the people who are on the site perhaps if there's any like other people who are on the site owners reps or whomever there is a threat of exposure and risk to one another that has never occurred before right and so you have that opportunity for a person who is infected to come to the work site and end up shutting it down 
you have the risk of a person who is infected coming to the site and spreading the disease perhaps to uh, owner's representatives or owner occupants who might be, you know, in the, maybe they're doing a remodel of one wing of the school and the, or the you know, company business building and the others are somewhere else. It's just such a different time. And that was one of the things that was raised in that session that, uh, you know, to Kim's point about all these rules and regulations that the in-house counsel, risk managers, uh, CEOs are trying to get their hands around, not to mention the project managers for managing their people on the site. But it is so complicated because it is, in fact, so complicated just because we have this uh, just a, a very unique threat. And I know for myself in contracting, we're contracting not only for, you know, the, the typical what I would call like the COVID terms about in the event of a pandemic, epidemic, et cetera, that you'd be able to. Uh, adjust the price, adjust the schedule, et cetera. You know, we're, we're working that into our contracting, but we're also working in um, about liability for exposure in, in the event that that would be to happen. So it's just a very unique time. And I thought that was worth mentioning because I don't think we've ever had to deal with that in our common era, in our, in our contemporary era of construction and design. Thanks, John. You got it. Does anyone else have any other comments or questions? before we move on to the next session. Yeah, John, this is Michael. I just wanted to make a brief comment going back maybe a couple is is that I, I think things are going to really continue to slow down over the next um, couple years. And I don't know when when they're going to start to pick back up uh, here at the Hillsborough County Aviation Authority. We've delayed or canceled nine hundred and five million dollars worth of projects over the next um, four years. And the the timing of of when those when those projects get built if ever is really up in the air and depends a lot upon how how quickly the recovery happens so i just i think that the audience should be aware that that there are going to be some very long term impacts um, across the board because of this disease agreed john no before way. you move, john before you move on this is frank i just wanted to go back to christine's comments which i thought we're really significant about what we're dealing with right now and where we find ourselves. Um, Christine was correct. Uh, contractors, owners, um, employers in general are trying to figure out how to keep workers safe. And we've implemented measures such as taking the temperatures, um, looking for symptoms, uh, having the employees fill out questionnaires before they get onto the job site. All of that is affecting productivity, but at least it's allowing the jobs to continue. But the, the, the the scarier aspect of that is, is that you have a number of people walking onto job sites and in general who are asymptomatic and don't show any of that, walking onto your job sites and contaminating them. And now you're also coupling that with starting to see um, employers being sued for wrongful death because of failure to, to create a safe environment for COVID. And so I think we're in for a little bit of a rocky road and I would certainly defer to the attorneys on the panel um, where we're trying to protect our employees the best we can and with, and with um, I, I guess, the, uh, uh, the best manners that are out there. Uh, but are they good enough? Because, as I said, the real fear is you have uh, folks walking around in, in, general, in the general public as well as on construction sites uh, asymptomatic. And some of the things we're doing now to test just aren't going to pick that up. And there's going to be an impact to pay at the end. A good point, Frank. Anyone else before we we uh, we one more one more comment we have time for and then we got to move on. All right, well we'll keep it rolling here. Force majeure. Uh, <laughs> the word the word of 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 the uh, of the times. Uh, on May twelfth, we discussed the. Force majeure, supply chain disruption, and delay claims. And uh, during that panel, uh, Kristen, who is with us, uh, obviously I'm going to direct the next questions to you, Kristen, uh, said uh, contractors experiencing a delay due to COVID-19 may be entitled to extra time, but may not be able to seek monetary compensation. The concept of for force majeure contractual provision that pr protects parties from liability in the event of extraordinary circumstances beyond their control is difficult to prove. 
To prove that they were impacted by COVID-19, contractors must demonstrate impossibility, impracticality, and frustration of purpose. So, uh, Kristen, you want to comment on your on your quote uh, as far as you know what you're seeing now versus what was happening in May, and and uh, what have what have you experienced in regards to how the whole topic of force majeure has been addressed? Um, so obviously, force majeure is going to be very contract dependent, <clears throat> and how each contract is written. Um, if you don't have a force majeure provision in your contracts, then you're you're left to obviously common law. Most construction contracts do have some sort of uh, force majeure provision in them. What we were discovered, what we've discovered is that most of them didn't actually mention pandemic, epidemic, anything specific that would entitle people to time or money um, that was COVID related. Now the the general catch all phrase circumstances beyond their the contractor's control and some of the other phrases most likely would cover uh, force majeure. Um, I represent owners when I draft my force majeure provisions, typically they get time, not money. Um, and that that is um, one of the things that we've seen, a, I've seen personally in the construction contracts that I've been negotiating since COVID push back on. Um, but I also push back because of the unforeseeability um, and, and we'll make sure that in my contracts with owners that if you're going to get any um, money, it is directly tied to COVID. It cannot be as, a, as what Michael was saying, everything thrown in with the kitchen sink in, to try to relate to COVID. And it must be unforeseeable um, and not capable of resolution prior to the signing of the contract. Um, but we have seen a, a lot of pushback on those type of um, money, uh, time, not money, um, force majeure provisions okay. from contractors. And, and it's to be expected, but, it, but we try to limit them, like I said, in the, in the ways that, that I mentioned. Another, another part of this discussion was supply chain disruption. And, and again, that's, you know, a lot of times that supply chain um, can be categorized as, as non-transferable risk or retained risk. What, what, have you, what are you seeing in terms of how your clients are dealing or, or are the contracts changing at all to, to, to protect against some of that disruption and some of those, again, unforeseeable, uncontrollable risks that you really can't transfer? Yeah, I think that the contracts are um, the one thing that I heard. So I wrote down three words that I heard a couple of times that people mentioned, and that was communication, cooperation, teamwork. And I think that um, in this era of COVID, we're all trying to work together, even though the contracts may not lim may, may limit some of those recoveries. Um, some of my advice to the clients moving forward is, do you want to end up with a fight at the end or do you want to maybe uh, negotiate something now um, to alleviate some of the contractor's pain um, so that you can get your project finished quicker um, and it's a better situation for everyone. It, it, think in terms of what's best for the project and not maybe necessarily what's best for you as the owner. Um, and that was a big theme. Uh, between Rhonda, Tracy, and myself, I think, and Anthony as well, we talked a lot about open communication. Contractors need to be talking to their subs. Subcontractors need to be talking to the contractors. Contractors need to be talking to the owners. Owner needs to be talking to the architect. And you all need to be meeting together to try to resolve these issues before they become the big, giant mess and fight that people like you guys at HKA <laughs> will end up helping us resolve at some point. <laughs> right. We can do it on our own through communication and negotiation. Right. This is Tracy. I was on that panel too. And um, that's, um, you know, I, everybody's been talking about leading up to this. Have things changed, right, since April or May or June um, with respect to this? And I think we talked about actually at that panel that we thought what would change is getting 
the entire project team to collaborate and cooperate more as opposed to being siloed. And I would say in 99% of the, the clients that I'm working with, um, that has actually happened with open communication, building trust, like um, Campra said, and, and constant communication and everybody willing to accept a piece of the damages as opposed to pointing fingers. And that's actually been working out um, like, you know, 99% of the time. I have a couple owners that are not cooperating, um, but we're hoping to work that out. Thanks, Tracy. I see. I see. Rhonda is on as well. Rhonda, can you? Are, are you able to uh, add any color to, to uh, your experience? Well, I can say from the AE uh, position that um, every contract. Uh, that I've negotiated or we're in negotiations with with owners, um, we're we're not getting any pushback or very little pushback on the portion of your clause additions that we are requesting, um, and we've kind of broken it out. Um, going to uh, Kristen's comment about cost, we're actually going with new provisions that are specific to COVID, um, such that it doesn't. Um, hurt or pain the owner so much that it's just any, that there would be on the book cost for any force reserve event. So we're pulling that out and um, specifically referencing uh, extra costs that might be, that we may incur because it's unknown to us um, at this time based on how governments or different countries uh, the rules and, and temporary regs they put into place. So we, we might have extra travel costs, uh, we might have extra compliance costs to, depending on what those regs are. And that way, you know, it's still a force majeure type event, but it's called out separately and the parties have been very willing to work in that regard, um, going back to the, you know, the communication, cooperation and teamwork aspect. So I would say that a way of getting around that is to, you know, yeah, it takes some additional crafting, but, but that's what we've, we've been doing. Um, and um, just sort of tangentially related to delay claims and uh, delays in claims. Uh, we're noticing from a transactional side that owners are now wanting to renegotiate master agreements and they're coming out, they're really being firm on no caps on liability, um, which is kind of a bitter pill to swallow, and um, um, the and payment terms are getting pushed out to nine days. Um, so I think those are things that are that owners are experiencing, and and again it goes back to the architects and engineers. I know we're looking at as design, design professionals to okay. We're gonna, team on this and, and we're going to have to uh, work with the owners who are having cash flow for a problem because we all are so just add that in along with that so thanks thanks Rhonda okay we're going to move on uh, to keep this rolling uh, June 9th we talked about the uh, ever important topic of resiliency and really kind of got off the technical side of things and more towards the psychological side and we had a quote here from from pam uh who pam i'll turn this to you and to, to, to get your feedback on this topic but you mentioned that you've been very impressed with how flexible everyone has been the technologies in particular have been pushed to the forefront faster than anticipated innovations such as contact tracing to find the root of an infection and devices mounted to helmets that detect and deter workers from working too close from one another have been pr particularly impressive. New technologies have allowed engineers, architects, designers to jump in and adopt to a virtual environment. There's still a lot to be done, but I'm excited about the change. And this was back in early June. What change what additional changes have you seen? Have things changed that much since June 9th? I think I, I think it's pretty much the same standard. I think people are still getting uh, just getting more proficient 
on their virtual devices. Um, I talked to Procore the other day and they were talking about how they're concerned about the, um, and like the mental, just the way society, how we're interacting, if that's having an impact. Um, our award of excellence winner, Chris Lieban, um, who we're, we're fetting this week, has brought up repeatedly um, that he's trying to figure out a new way to work because he uh, he's the chief sustainability officer for LA Metro. And he's so used to being with people and kind of picking their brains and seeing how they act. So I think that now that we're able to work virtually, the next step is to try to collaborate a little better and to, um, you know, to, you know, for the creativeness of the engineers and the architects and the contractors, like that, that might be suffering a little bit without the human interaction. So I think that's the next step where we need to go is to try to figure out how to how to do that. And then the other thing that was brought up was the the concern about um, you know mental health on the on this panel. We talked about mental health, um, and and that's still a concern and it's a growing concern. I think. Uh, for all of us being isolated, um, not being with our coworkers, not being able to see faces or to see really how people are interacting. Um, so technologically, I think we're we're doing really good still. I still think that I mean I think that the next issue is that mental that mental piece, that creative piece. Uh, we'd have to figure that out. Christine, uh, this was your your panel, and this was your your uh, brainchild. Uh, what what stands out most from the panel as far as uh, what was important to resiliency and what you're seeing? Yeah, thanks. Um, a couple of things. the The reason to Camprat's point about how so many projects are up in the air. So many projects are up in the air across the world, probably, but it's certainly across the United States. Because we're having to have a conversation with ourselves about redefining how we do what we do, how we interact. It's kind of getting us down to the core level of what we do, how we do, how we do family, how we do educating our kids. How do we balance educating our kids at home while we're trying to work at home, right? How do we balance getting our project done when all the cabinet makers or half the cabinet makers are home with their children because they can't be in school and somebody's got 10 to the kids? I mean, that's what that's like a literal problem that I was managing for one of my clients on a major project here. So it's just such a different time, which goes to the point that Pam raised about the psych issue and you know the the levels of stress that we all have lawyers and leaders that was one of the things that i would say every time we had a, one of our uh sessions that lawyers and leaders are the people that that our people come to they come to us for answers we don't necessarily have the answers right now that's stressful and as well as we have, might have our own home life challenges that we're dealing with so there's just so much in that arena that just cries out for all of us to take a deep breath and be resilient just find a way to be flexible the rigid person is going to be crushed through this situation. The rigid corporation, the rigid small yeah. company is going to be crushed. We have to be flexible and we have to be able to redefine how we do what we do. And it's a philosophical idea, but it is critical to success. It's a critical competency in 2020. Who knew? But it is a very, very important <laughs> thing for all of us and our clients. It really is, both professionally and personally. Absolutely. So uh, the next uh, topic that we went over uh, on May 5th was public projects. And obviously public projects had have their own um, their own dynamics. You know, the, the whole idea between essential and non-essential was, was, was a very big topic, particularly back in May. Uh, Tom Nasalki from Hartsville Jacksonville International had a quote we understand the big external factors affecting contractors, especially since we, as employees ourselves, are also being exposed to some of the same things. Whether it's working from home or social distancing, it really comes down to communicating early and often. 
We're always ready to, to discuss impact, but if you're going to have that discussion, it's going to be based on actuals. I expect an open book if you're coming to us for additional costs. I'm willing to listen, but I wanna see the information that supports your rationale. So Jim, I'm gonna direct this to, to you. Uh, on the public projects that you're interacting with, you know, what are you seeing in terms of how the contractors and the public owners are interacting? Are they, are they still playing nice? In the early stages, the public owners that I was exposed to were, were, and the contractors were, were, were playing very nice. Is that still the case? I think it depends on the parties. Most of the time, the sophisticated parties on the larger projects are, are used to claim situations and they recognize some of the comments that the other panelists have already made. And that is, you're better off trying to come to the table, roll up your sleeves and negotiate something that works for everyone now. Uh, getting at Tom's quote from that, that uh, panel back on May 5th, it really comes down to the underlying data. And when we talk about scheduled delays, you know, one of the things we grapple with on these projects is uh, segregating sequential delays and concurrent delays. I think everyone knows that COVID-19 is an impact on a project, and it's not just an impact on one project for a contractor. It's a portfolio-wide impact on many projects. And so you really got to look at um, the data and see were there delays for which the owner or the contractor was responsible prior to COVID-19 impact so that COVID-19 really adds a confounding factor to trying to get at the, the open book nature or the bottom line as to how you, how you apportion responsibility for delays and get at payment for impacts. I, uh, Mike's comment about eroding trust uh, also piqued my interest because it's really the same subject. When you've got contractors that are impacted company-wide on their projects, they I won't say that there's a motivation to look for weak spots in their owner project portfolio, but the owner on the owner side, they really need to be careful and look at the data and see and make sure they're not paying for, for sins for which they're not responsible. Um, and on the contractor side, when I'm counseling contractors about putting the claims together, the question becomes helping them put their best foot forward, put an accurate uh, estimate together of the cost that's based on actual data. If we're at a point in a project where they're beyond the learning curve and we're now months into this, people have been working with PPE, they've been working with social distancing, we're kind of beyond the stage where we have to estimate what impacts are we know essentially what our productivity is going to be for activities that have been ongoing. Now, we don't know that for activities that haven't started yet, but there's a lot of data out there and we need to kind of get to the bottom of what really caused delays and make sure that we understand the impacts and the actual costs. The, the quality of the data we see across the board varies widely. We've got some construction managers and contractors with very accurate daily reports cost reports that and, and updated schedules that track actual productivity on the job and the status of the job. And in that case, it makes it easier to sort through these things. But it's always difficult when we've got uh, concurrent delays. Um, and then also on forward-looking projects, I think Kristen made the comment about um, working with her clients on how you structure contracts going forward. And I think that's a great Point to talk about even on public projects where we've got some owners that take the mindset that they want you know a bulletproof COVID-19 clause where the contractor can never come back for costs and I think uh, lawyers have to have a pretty frank discussion with their clients about what that really means in terms of cost up front in the contract what the contractor has to do when they're faced with that type of risk and really does it make more sense to come up with a clause that certainly holds the the contractor's feet to the fire in taking account of known issues with COVID-19 and adjusting their schedule to take into account those known impacts, um, particularly as it relates to supply chain, whether they've done their due, due diligence to make sure 
that supplies are going to be available and then crafting a clause that holds them to that, but also um, addresses the unforeseen impacts of COVID-19 and how costs for unforeseen or unknowable or unforeseeable, however you want to define it, impacts um, are compensated if they're compensated. Uh, I think one other comment is um, relates to notice and this gets a little bit to some of the discussion that Christine was having a minute ago. And clients can take a couple different attitudes when they get notice of a claim. But I think the most constructive way to look at it is, look, notices are required under the contract. From an owner's perspective, you've demanded that the contractor give you notice when there's a claim. And don't look at the notice as necessarily trying to build a claim but look at it as an invitation to collaborate on mitigation, right? How can we roll up our sleeves? How can we stay around the table? And how can we come up something that works for everybody uh, under the COVID-19 uh, scenarios? All good points, Jim, thank you. Um, we're getting close to the top of the hour and I, I, I may we may run five minutes over, but I wanna really wanna hit this last topic. I'd like to get Lisa involved a bit. Um, uh, Lisa, on the May 19th program, uh, the learning curve on tech and business, and just, uh, you had mentioned that my home city of Boston was the first city in the nation to shut down construction on March 16th to prevent the spread of COVID. This decision set the city and its mayor at odds with the Commonwealth. That rip has not that rift has not entirely mended, entirely mended, and Boston mayor. Marty Walsh and Governor Charlie Baker still disagree on what's best. To keep track, we've developed an online tracker to monitor, to monitor all 50 states with hyperlinks to state orders and web pages where new orders are tracked. Are you still using this tool? And are there, are there, are there any other tools that you've developed since May 19th? You know what? We have stopped updating the tool. It, it, you know, hit a plateau beyond which the information just didn't quite seem um, necessarily relevant anymore. You know, things got somewhat back to normal, um, and the states all sort of grounded themselves in what their approach to various industries would be, and and seemed to really level out and become consistent and understand, um, and was understood among project participants. Um, but there are so many great resources. ENR in particular has been such a wonderful resource. Um, the, the forum, I just saw the newsletter come around the other day and there was a great article someone had written on force majeure from a really kind of practical perspective. So I think that luckily and thankfully we as an industry are kind of taking a bit of an exhale to understand where we've been and kind of, you know, level set. So, um, it was it was certainly much much needed and got a ton of traffic and was very helpful when this was going down in March April and into May but um, it's you know it luckily has gotten better so Frank uh, from that particular panel on, on May nineteenth as far as the learning curve on tech and anything stand out to you or, and what are what do you think is changing from a tech standpoint you know what beyond just the you know these go-to meetings and webinars is there anything in, in, from the tech side that you think is uh is important to the to the industry overall or, or that's changed since may 19th yeah john i think what uh, struck me was by the time we got to may 19th and of course by the time we finished the series um tools that were uh meant to just help us through a once in a lifetime situation, all of a sudden came, uh, became part of our working environment on a daily basis. Um, you know, before, uh, before March, Zoom was something you saw in a Marvel comic book, and now it's a tool that's indispensable. Uh, so the technology has now evolved to the point and is being used where uh, what I see now, obviously, is everyone on the panel is, you know, what does become the normal as we go forward? Will technology play the role? Uh, will we go back to offices like we did before? Can we use virtual depositions, uh, virtual hearings, uh, even virtual mediation? So the question, the biggest change I saw is how those things that were meant as stopgap measures 
will now become part of our daily lives and how it will change the way we do things going forward. Thanks, Frank. So we are at the top of the hour and I do wanna leave a couple of minutes for Christine to talk about where we're headed with the program. Uh, we really, we got through all the programs, but three. So we got through uh, eight of the 11 programs. Uh, but I wanna pause for a minute, just like I did uh, after the first four. Uh, is, does anyone have any comments that they would like to bring up regarding uh, the force majeure, um, supply chain disruption, public projects, uh, technology, anything that we went, we've gone over uh, over the last four slides. Does anybody have anything they'd like to share with the group? I'll just say quickly a thank you to Christine for brain for having the brain child of the slide on resilience and you know mental health and I don't know if anyone saw, but my eight-year-old had come in while we were on here. So I had to kind of give her a kiss, hear what she needed, pivot back to this. And I think that what you said, Christine, about we are leaders and attorneys, and when clients come to us, they expect answers, and they're under a great deal of stress. And it's almost that we have to sort of swallow our own stress and and be there. And of course we are, but it does create a lot of, um, you know, resonance. And, and it's really wonderful that you're, as a leader of our organization, are, are talking about those things. So thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, John, I'm just going to take that opportunity to pass the baton over to me and, and say a few words of thanks to you. And uh, thanks, Lisa, for those nice words. It's so true. Normalizing the conversation about mental health is critical. And the ABA is a leader in that. The forum has adopted a, a, a well-being toolkit for lawyers, but it's applicable to anyone to be able to see people who are in need uh, for or at the brink of crisis and be able to help them. And every one of us is strong. Every one of us is a leader in our own environments and our own ways, but we're all human beings. And we all need to be able to talk things out to get support. So I just can't say enough how important that is uh, from a survival standpoint, as well as from a resiliency standpoint. Very, very important. So let's all normalize it. Let's be there for one another. It's really important. Uh, but uh, just before we pass uh, uh, and, and wrap up today, I want to say thanks to John for putting this program together. John Palin, you're just a great team member. Thank you so much. Thanks to HKA. Thanks to ENR uh, and, and to HKA being a sponsor and giving the Forum on Construction Law an opportunity to collaborate here. Again, thank you to Tracy Doyle, Frank Junta, and Rob Roosh for having worked with me to put this whole series together. And uh, we're just so very grateful and so very proud of, of being able to be the voice for the industry during this very critical time. So for those of you who are interested in joining us for the next round of the Leadership Roundtable, we'll begin on September 15. The sessions are always on Tuesdays at four o'clock Eastern. It will be for one hour going forward, one hour of time. So four to five Eastern time starting September 15, the 22nd, and the 29th and we'll take a break in October and we'll come back in early November. So please put that on your calendar and join us next time. Also a reminder about going to the ambar.org website, construction law, that's the forum on construction law main page and there you will see the resource page link for all of the recordings and all the summaries of all 11 of our leadership roundtables thus far. So on behalf of all of us, I thank you for joining us. I thank you again, John and HKA. And on behalf of the ABA Forum on Construction Law, I say be well, take good care of each other and keep talking about it. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Christine. And just a reminder, uh, this hour was recorded. If anyone is interested in the recording, uh, feel free to reach out. And all of the recordings for all the sessions are available on the ABA Forum research page. So thanks for taking the time to join us. It was nice to get us all together. Um, it's a bit of a challenge having a panel of, of many like this, but I think we pulled it off. So thanks again. Great. Thank, Thank you, John. You. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great seeing you all. Well. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone.